read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners hey i cannot believe it we're finally back after two weeks off did they noticed or no? No, I don't think anybody knew. They were like, yo, you were gone? No. <laughs> so it was only back. two weeks and I feel, like I feel like I forgot how to do everything. Oh, we definitely did. We have forgotten how to do any of this shit because we were seriously trying to figure out what time are we doing this? We've been doing it at the same time for a year. I know. <laughs> How did we forget it? Well, thank you for being here with us this week. We have a brand new book from Inez Johnson, Two of By C is the name of it. And I am actually really excited. I've never read Inez Johnson before, but um, we reached out to her about being on the podcast and I looked at her backlist of her books. Number one, she has Dragon Shifters, I which know. right off the bat had me. But she's got a little bit of everything. She does. If you look at her stuff, like any kind of thing you're in the... She has Minaj. She has BDSM. She has reverse harem. She has like contemporary. She has tons of paranormal, urban fantasy, steamy paranormal romance. Like it is all. It's all there. Got something for everybody. Yeah. So uh, we're just going to talk about all her good stuff in just a few minutes. But since we were gone for two weeks, we're going to play catch up. And the first thing I want to ask you about is Britney Spears' baby. What's going on with this? Is she pregnant? Is she not pregnant? Is she having a baby? What's going on? I have no idea. It's getting hard to keep up with what's real and what's not real. I wonder if it's just like she's doing this to fuck with all of us. What if she's like this genius mastermind and she's just fucking with us? Well, she keeps calling him her husband. Yes, yes. She says her and husband all the time. Now she's saying my baby. Well, and but she said, there's not been a report of a marriage or... Like, well, no, she did say that Donatella Versace was making her wedding dress. And then a couple weeks ago, she posted up a picture. Oh, it was in her stories. I don't think it's... She's the queen of posting something on Instagram and then taking it down. Yeah. So she had a picture. I don't know if it was in her stories or on her grid. Of her and Donatella Versace. And it was like, oh, yeah. Oh, she's getting her wedding dress fitted, I bet. She didn't say that, but I was like, she said that's who's making her dress. So I wondered if that was it. And then she was at her house, but she keeps already calling him her husband. And if they had gotten married in America, Mm -hmm. then somebody would have found the record already. Sniff that out in two seconds. Yeah. Yeah, sure. somebody at the clerk of courts would have been paid handsomely for that info. But when I watch um, Love After Lockup, these people are always like, we're spiritually married. <laughs> so maybe that's what they are. Do you file that on your taxes? Is that is that a tax bracket? <laughs> spiritually married? So. You know what? I get it. Yeah, that, it's okay. To each their own. Some people enjoy the common law aspect where they're like, you know what? We can benefit from this, but we also don't have to go through the process of a divorce if we hate each other. Yeah. So, but it's you know, getting messy because then last week we haven't heard anything about she pulled in her ex. Yes, K Fed. She Who's brought in Kevin so, Federline. He's been so quiet for years mm-hmm. and years and years. Yep. Which he says he's done on purpose. He dropped off. He's living a normal life because he has the kids the majority of the time. Yeah, he's also got the money too. Because that's from her. You know, he gets paid, you know, alimony. She pays for everything for the kids. That's what, you know, when we were talking about it before, you're like. I was actually surprised by how little his child support was. Really? Yeah. I wonder how much it is. I don't know. It's posted somewhere. But what were you going to say? Well, no, you can Google it. But I was just going to say, when we discussed this the other day, because the thing about KFED came up. And I said, I feel like he's been quiet this whole time because he's had some, it's been benefiting him to not speak up because you got to think if he, he gets $20,000 a month, $20,000 a month. Mm-hmm. I got to think there's more than that coming in from somewhere. Cause that's what, when I heard it, I maybe did that's what's on that record. Was, and because I also know he doesn't live, but like a few miles from her so mm-hmm. that she can be close. to the, So that means he's living in a very expensive area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I'm sure that's going to take a chunk of the 20,000. 
I, again, I think there's other, maybe that's just what's on record. That's maybe what the judge appointed, but I have no doubts that he's being paid to be quiet. Cause like I said, he loved her at some point, you know, he cared for her. She's the mother of his children. I think if it wasn't benefiting him to be quiet, he would have spoken up a long time ago and sold a fucking book. He I got, just, I just he got $1.3 million in the divorce. Mm-hmm. Which I don't think is a lot either. I don't think that's a lot either. For, for them. Like, I don't no. know. But I bet that dad was there when she did that divorce. And he is, as yeah. we can tell, not mm-hmm. fucking around. He wouldn't want that kid coming mm-hmm. for that money. Yeah. I bet you when they got divorced, actually, I would bet almost anything that when they got divorced, something was signed that he could never talk about what happened between them about any of that stuff. Maybe so. I bet that that was in the agreement to some degree. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But, you know, the whole baby thing came up and I was just like, I, I mean, me and Brittany Spears are the same age. I know that's hard to believe because I look so young still, but me and B-Girl, we're the same age. No, I actually would have thought you were younger than her because I always felt like she was older than me by, I don't know. No, we're only like, I think we're like maybe three or four months apart. But my thing is, when I heard she was pregnant, my old ass was like, nope, (laughs) no, my eggs have expired, honey. We are not doing this again. Brittany girl, where are you at? (laughs) What is happening in your life? You know, because I just think like at my age, there's no fucking way I'm having another kid. And she's just signing up for it. But I know. But she's also mm-hmm. like her. She's with that fitness guy. So I'm sure they're like in great shape. So she probably feels like and eat great. Mm-hmm. So she probably feels alive. I just <laughs> ordered two corn dogs and onion rings for dinner with a strawberry That's milkshake. Wonderful. I think I'm pr- feeling pretty good. I'll be honest. That's true. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. The other thing I have, I have so many things to tell you. So not even the other thing. The next thing I watched Downton Abbey. Do you know this show? I know I, the show. I've never seen the show before. I think it came out and somebody said it was 2010 or something. I was like, fuck, I'm like 20, I'm like 12 years behind on the show, but there are six seasons and there's around nine episodes each season. And every episode is an hour or more. It's a lot of episodes. If you've ever thought to yourself, you know what? I might want to watch that one day. Fucking do it. It is so good. And there's a couple of reasons. It is very calm. It is the most peaceful, calm, just relaxing show. There's a ton of drama and shit that happens. But it's just done in such a way. It's written so beautifully that you're just sitting there. And, like, I was crying through the seasons. Like, I'm so invested in these characters. But, like, and I'm laughing my ass off. Like, and it's so, so good. But there is, like, the characters are complex. You hate some of them. And they, but you still want them to succeed. And it's so real. Because some of the characters are terrible people, but you still, by the end of it, you're like, I just want something good to happen to them, you know, so they're not like miserable their whole lives. So I watched all of it during the break and it was fantastic. (laughs) And I like, there's a movie afterwards. They had a movie that came out in 2018 and I watched that and there's a new one that comes out next month, a new movie. And I was like, I'm going to watch that too because it, I could not get enough of it. And I almost want to go back and watch it again. It's so, so good. But it's just about this big family that lives in this house. It's a mother, a father, and they have three daughters. And they live in this big, huge manor in um, outside of London in the 1920s. And it's about the family. Like, they're, you know, sort of, I don't guess, like, aristocratic. I don't know what the term for that is. They have, like, titles and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it's about the staff that takes care of them. And it's all these people who, like, lowly servants and these rich people with all this stuff. And it's about kind of like how their lives parallel and stuff. So it's really interesting. And it's not something I think I would have ever like sought after to watch, but I had so many people tell me how great it was. I was like, I'm just going to watch it one day and just put it on. I see people talking about it all the time. It's so relaxing and so calm. And it's just, it was so nice. It was something great to watch at the end of the day where I would just put it on before bed or something and I would watch it and then just go to sleep. (laughs) <laughs> it was great. So 
I've been uh, watching um, reruns of Bridezilla, and that is not calming. <laughs> I know. I think that's what I liked is that this one had a lot of drama, but it wasn't like anxiety ridden drama, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't know. Um, I also, I saw Abby Knox a couple of times during the break too. Where once was um, for her birthday. We went and saw The Lost City with Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum. The yeah, one where she's like a that? romance author. So fucking good. So fucking good. He always like, talks so highly of her. 10 out of 10 home run. I love Sandra Bullock. I love her. I love the way he talks about her. Anytime he yes. talks about Sandra Bullock, mm -hmm. I'm like, are you like in love with her? Kind of? I hope he is. I love her. Although he's with Zoe Kravitz and I, I ship that. But I don't, you know, what's funny is so my mom, uh, my mom and dad had a place in Tybee Island. It's like off the coast of Georgia. It's a little uh, beach island. Um, it's off the coast of Savannah. So, like, if you ever go to Savannah, Georgia, it's like 20 minutes away. You can go right out there. I have family that lives there. And my mom and my dad, for a while, rented a place that was out there. It just so happened. It wasn't because my parents lived in, like, a super fancy place. Sandra Bullock moved next door to them. And so, like, this was, like, I guess in the early 2000s. Um, she had a big house next, right next to them and they had it fenced off and everything. But my mom would go for walks and stuff in the morning and she would pass Sandra Bullock. And she said like Sandra would be coming towards her. And my mom said the first time I saw her, I thought there's no way that's her. She's tiny. There's no way. And my mom's a petite woman, mm -hmm. but she was like, she came by and she was just like, good morning. And she was like, holy fuck. That was her. She's so little. Is so she? I wouldn't have expected. I guess I just thought her to be normal ish. I well, know. of course they're all skinny. Yeah, yeah. But at the time when she lived there, she was dating Matthew McConaughey and Sandra's sister got married at that house. And they were my parents were there when it happened that they had like big like canopies and stuff put over their house because there were helicopters that were like buzzing around all day trying to get pictures of her and Matthew McConaughey together. And my mom was telling me later, she was like, I was so disgusted about how crazy, like people were like lining up at the front of her gate to get glimpses of them and stuff. And she was like, I felt horrible for them that this was yeah. the life they led, you know, that they had no privacy. But millions but, and millions of dollars. Yeah, I know. It right? comes with a job. <laughs> yeah, I guess I so. I say it's like a trade off. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's not even a job you can quit. She was at her house. You know, yeah. like, can you imagine being like, okay, I make the bargain that when I'm out in public, I get, I have to put on this persona. I got to have my picture taken. And I'll give autographs, but you should be able, when you go home, you go home. And it was like, no, this was not the end of her day. When she went home, it was like, guess what? We still want your photo. So it was Remember just when like. she dated um, Ryan Jesse Gosling? James? Oh God, she married him. Oh, I wonder and what like she would say about her? that. Now. Yes. Yeah, I wonder what she would I say about that now. Because me and my husband were talking about her for some reason or something. Mm -hmm. And I looked him up. And man, he aged bad, mm -hmm. bad, yep. bad, bad, bad. The worst thing he ever did was fuck with her. That was, yep. like, he doesn't look break like he's heart. doing too great. No. But The Lost City, though, if you haven't seen it, absolutely seen it. As a romance writer, it is phenomenal as even a romance reader is phenomenal but it's such a great kind of like little twist on the story is that so she's the author he's the cover model and she has a brand new book that's out and they're doing a book tour and all the women that are there for the book tour want to see the model they don't really want to talk to her or ask her about the book but he loves that she's such a great writer he's like you're incredible your mind's brilliant he said you know, at first I thought it was kind of hokey and silly that I was on these covers. I was embarrassed. He was like, but then I read the books and they're fantastic. And so I love that about him, that he appreciated like her writing and her stories. And, that you know, he loved playing Dash. Like he loved being that character. Yeah. And so I, it was it was so good, you know, and Abby and I left and we were both like, loved it. See it again. Mm -hmm. 10 out of 10. It was great. So. It definitely gave me those old school, like Jewel of the Nile, romancing the stone fields. So, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, it was great to kind of go back to that, too. Oh, before I forget, Abby Knox, she and I talked about this. She's doing it's called Big Bad Love. Excuse me. It's this series that she wrote. 
and it is a plus size sorority. And so that's what, like the girl in the first book is called Big Bad Love. And the girl that's in it starts the sorority that's her plus size girls only. And she kicks it off of doing an auction and she auctions out her services. She's supposed to like clean and do laundry and stuff. And so she gets bit on by like this guy who's like i don't even he's not in uh fraternity because he it says on the bio i read it but um he's basically like he's not a man whore because she doesn't write those but um i guess he's just kind of an asshole you know and so um she the heroine is just like are you fucking kidding me but she does it because he's going to donate a lot of money that's money to the sorority yeah and she's like well maybe this won't be so bad <laughs> and so he gets her to do other favors but I just loved it. It was such a cute idea when she was telling me about it. And then she's got two more, I think, planned in the series. One of them, well, she says maybe it'll be a series. But the pre-order's up now, anyways, just to let y'all know. Big Bad Love. Because I just saw it earlier. It went up. But um, the second book is a girl. She kills somebody in the mafia. It's like a revenge hit or something. And she goes to the sorority and hides there. And it's <laughs> like, that's where she's hiding in it. I that's know, a good idea. Yeah. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it also sounds so fun. It reminded me of that, like, the, what's that one with this, like, sorority bunny, the movie or something, where she's, like, hiding in the sorority. I can't remember, but it's something like that. But, yeah. So, anyways, I wanted to mention that, too, while we're talking about it. But let me tell you about Inez Johnson before I get too deep into all this other stuff I want to talk about. All right. So, I'll read you her author bio. It's really cute. Lover of fairy tales, folklore, and mythology, Ines Johnson spends her days reimagining the stories of old in a modern world. She writes books where the damsels cause the, cause the distress, princesses wield swords, and moms save the world. You can sign up for her mailing list and receive alerts and free reads at, and it gives the link on her Amazon thing, it's Ines News on her website. And then tired of newsletters? Question <laughs> mark? I get it. Just click the orange follow button on Amazon and it will alert you every time there's a new release, which I think is smart to tell people to do. I don't know if most people know you can do that on Amazon. You go follow your author, you'll get an alert every time that there's a new release. They're really kind of slow though. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Some It's not too great. I've followed some and it's not very dependable in my opinion. I wonder because I follow, I only follow like three or four. I don't follow a bunch and I always get an email when they've got something new out. Maybe it's because some of the people I follow release a lot. So yeah. maybe they just don't do it often or something, but I don't feel like yeah. I get them as often as I should for some people. Well, and maybe if or they don't they've do been pre-orders. Out for a while. I think it's best for pre-orders. Yeah. That's when it really comes in handy. Yeah. I get a lot of pre-order notifications too when stuff like that goes up. Um, oh, and so the book that you're going to listen to today is called Tooth by Sea, and I'll read you the book bio for that too. Set sail on this fish out of water adventure as the Arthurian lady of the lake, lady of the lake, crash lands into the great god of the sea. Finally freed from her role as Camelot's lady of the lake, Vivian sets off on the quest of her life to nab her very own pair of Italy's hottest designer high heels. But when she turns up in Athens instead of Rome, she'll face her greatest challenge when the gods of the sea decide she's the catch of a lifetime. I love it. So um, she is giving away this week. She's giving away three sun paperbacks. Um, there's Templar Scrolls, uh, The Spear of Destiny, and First Night. And you can see all of these on her website and on her, um, her Amazon page if you go check those out. And then um, she said there's another book in this series, in the 2FIC. She said it's coming out in July, but she doesn't have the pre-order up quite yet. So just be on the lookout for that. Um, she did say that um, if you like urban fantasy with a side of romance, you can get the Nye Rivers Adventures and the Misadventures of Lauren. And also the Knights of, I think it's Corleone, if you like steamy paranormal romance. And... You know, she's got a ton of books. So, and like I said earlier, she's got BDSM, Reverse Harem, Dragon Shifters, Menage. There is something on there for you. So, I'll have all sure the links and all of that stuff in the show notes. And you can yes. also always go to our website and I'll have her up on the homepage where everything will be on her mm -hmm. page to get everything. All those clickable links. Mm -hmm. So, I guess let's play the first installment. This is Two If by C by Inez Johnson. Read for you by Wesley Paul. Chapter 1 
Vivi broke the surface of the sea in a spray of surf. Foam tickled the bottoms of her feet. Suds rolled off her shoulders. Droplets of salted water soaked into the fabric of her dress. The dress she wore had been the height of fashion when she was a girl back in the 15th century. The women and witches of Camelot would parade around the riverbed in these types of gowns while on the arms of knights and lords. Vivi doubted she'd ever walk escorted on a man's arm. She didn't care. She could walk on her own now. She was no longer the Lady of the Lake, cursed by a deformity at birth to never use her legs outside of the water. She was Vivi on land. After years of living in the River Usk on the grounds of Carleon, where the current kingdom of Camelot sat, she was simply thrilled to be out of the water and on her own two feet. Her powerful friends, because, yeah, Vivi had friends now, had broken the curse, but she wasn't exactly cured. Her legs were still as useless as eyelids on a fish. To offset this, Lady Gwyn, the most powerful witch in all of Camelot, and Dame Lauren, the first female knight of the round table, had enchanted a pair of shoes so Vivi could walk on land. Though she loved the Nico Terra heels she donned, Vivi had been wearing the same pair for a while now, and they were so last season. The designer's new batch was releasing in the morning, and Vivi would be the first in line at his shop in Rome to snag her very own pair. She stood up in the water, her magic supporting her useless lower limbs. With a flick of her wrist, she shook all of the water from the gown. She wanted to look her best for her very first solo trip out of Camelot, not like a fish out of water. So soggy clothes wouldn't do. Once her dress was dry, she stepped into the magical shoes that fit her dainty feet perfectly. Taking a deep breath as she prepared for the completion of her maiden quest as an independent woman, Vivi took a step onto dry land and fell flat on her face. Walking was still a new skill for her. She was also on new ground here in Italy, but she was undaunted. She rose, dusted herself off, and the world fell away from her. She was being lifted into the air. There was no ground beneath her heeled feet, no water to weave her magic in. It was terrifying, just like it had been when she was a child and had been cast into the cold river waters to drown. But she hadn't drowned in the water. She'd survived and thrived. In the air, she flailed. Her limbs punched and kicked out, anxious to find a way to anchor herself in the light breeze. Looking down, she saw that a sea monster had her in his grip. The beast was big and broad, with dark tendrils radiating from his head like an octopus, and brown skin like the glistening coat of a seal. Vivi hated anything with tentacles like eels and octopi. But she liked seals. The creatures were fiercely protective of their young. Still, a seal had never picked her up and out of the water. No seal had ever flashed its teeth at her as this brute did. His broad and wide teeth gleamed white as he prepared to eat her. She kicked out again and made contact. All her attempts at defense earned her was the loss of one of her precious shoes. Vivi slumped in the beast's grip and shut her eyes. She'd come so far on her own, and now she would be eaten by this terrible monster, and there was nothing she could do about it. She was out of the water. She was defenseless. She was as useless as her father had accused her of being before he tossed her in the waters to meet her death. And this time, she was going to die. Hello, said the monster. The deep melodic tone of his voice was like a shockwave inside Vivi. It rolled up her lifeless toes, shook her limp knees, warmed the spot at the crest of her thighs, and punched her in the gut until she was forced to open her eyes and look at him. His eyes were the color of sea waves before they crashed into the shore. She felt caught in them like she'd been pulled under and was now drowning in earnest. Bonjour, he said, and another wave hit her, pulling her down deeper. Ciao. Hola. Can you speak at all? Of course I can speak, Vivi said. I speak a number of languages, you beast. I don't appreciate being trifled with. 
Get it over with, and I hope you choke on my bones. His sea-bright eyes widened, and he flashed his teeth again. Vivi struggled, trying to turn away before he bit her. Instead, she stared at his beauty in avid fascination. She wondered if he was the type to play with his food. Eat you, he said. I'm not going to eat you. The way he glanced down her captive body, the way his nostrils flared and his sharp, gleaming incisors sank into his lush bottom lip, Vivi was certain he told a lie. I was only trying to help, he said when his gaze rose back to her. I was being a gentleman. No gentleman I know touches a lady without her permission, she said. Put me down. She didn't expect it, but he obeyed. He turned his body away from the receding tide and set her down gently on the sand. Vivi breathed a sigh of relief the moment her toes touched the ground. Only one foot was shooed, so the moment the monster let her go, she fell to her knees. His arms were around her once more, bringing her up. This time, he held her to his big body instead of in the air. The toe of her one shoe tapped the ground. The other foot, the one that was bare, rested on the top of the beast's foot. It doesn't appear you can stand on your own, he said. I can too, Vivi frowned up at him, feeling like a guppy arguing with a whale. I just need my shoe. The beast peered down at her fallen shoe, then back at her. He crouched with her still in his arms until he sat her bottom gently on the ground. He took a seat beside her, and then he reached for the lone shoe. Vivi flinched when he reached for her leg next. She whimpered when he flashed his teeth at her again. When his fingertips wrapped around the back of her knee, she shuddered, the fear of being eaten momentarily fleeing her body. Who are you? He asked in that deep brogue. What are you? I am Vivian of the Lake. Well, actually, it's just Vivian now. Well, my friends call me Vivi. He should know that she had friends, people who would notice if she was gone too long, or eaten by a sea monster with dark skin, thick locks of hair, and deep blue eyes. May I? The blue-eyed monster asked. May I call you Vivi? Vivi's breath caught at the request. His blue eyes implored her, even as his wide, shark-like grin promised to devour her. Do you promise not to eat me? He broke into a smile again. This time, he didn't flash his teeth. His lips stretched across his face as he gazed at her. The look heated her from the center outward, touching her pale cheeks. She felt his thumb rub at her skin, settling on the moisture there. Then he frowned, and Vivi was sorry to see his hungry smile go. He looked down at her knee, and she followed his gaze. The skin there had torn from her fall and a trickle of blood flowed. The monster reached out to the water. It came to him without him even standing in it. The water swirled in his hand, and he placed it on her knee. Vivi gasped as a warm tingle arrested her leg. His touch felt like diving deep in a hot spring, like surfacing from beneath a waterfall on a summer's day. My name's Poseidon. My friends call me Sai. I'd like it if you called me Sai, Vivi. He didn't flash his teeth this time when he smiled at her. Still, Something in his eyes told her that she would not be safe with this man. She didn't believe that he meant her any physical harm, but she knew that her world would never be the same if she took the offer to call him by his name. All right, she said. Sigh. Chapter Two Vivi Sai liked the way her name sounded in his mouth. His two front teeth pressed into the center of his lower lip to start the V sound. Then they had to bounce and catch quickly to let the sound burst forth, much like she'd just burst through the waters. Vivi. The vibrations that came from making the sound fluttered over his tongue. They shivered down his throat, 
exciting his vocal cords. They ignited a path in his chest, landing in his heart like a pulsar that burned out the cobwebs that had collected there over centuries, over millennia. Vivi. He said it out loud this time. After his teeth made the double bounce on his lower lip, he flashed them at the nymph. She recoiled from him, turning her body from him as though preparing for a blow. Sai so couldn't fathom why she'd do that sitting beside him. He would never hurt her. He wanted to pull her to him. He wanted to taste her skin. To run his tongue and teeth over the moisture that had collected on her knee at that spot where he'd healed her. And then he remembered what she'd said. Are you going to eat me? She thought he was actually going to eat her. It made sense if she came from the waters. That's how amphibian predators advance on their prey. Flashing their teeth was a sign of aggression. Sai smiled again, flashing his teeth bright and wide. Oh, he wanted to eat her all right, but not in the way she thought. You have my word, Vivi, that nothing will harm you while you're in my care. And Sai intended to keep her in his care. You'll... Poseidon, you say? Greek god of the sea, at your service. The moment the words left his lips, he regretted it. Sai scrubbed his hand over his face, which turned the huge grin he'd been wearing into a wary frown. His throat constricted and his heartbeat dulled. The blanket of moroseness settled over his shoulders as he waited. It no longer mattered now that he'd revealed himself, he wouldn't want to kiss or bite this woman after she began making her requests of him and his power. Very soon, she'd treat him like all the other illicit idolaters, the deceptive, devoted, and the fake friends. He'd had a fleeting moment of anonymity with a creature who had seemed so out of the ordinary that it had warmed his cold-blooded heart, and he'd blown it in the worst possible way, by telling her the truth. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Vivi weighing his name and title. Belatedly, he wondered what value she'd put to it. What would she ask of him? And then he realized that whatever she asked, he was going to give it to her. Interestingly enough, her eyes didn't look entirely calculating. No, they didn't look at all like she was scheming or concocting a plan of entrapment. She was frowning at him. Now she was shaking that pretty little head of hers from left to right. And wait, did she just tisk him? I'm sorry to tell you, god of the sea, but this particular sea is in an awful state, she said. It's filled with human refuse from the trash on the seabed to the chemicals in the water, to the crowding of the vessels on the surface. And your sea creatures are quite uncivilized. Sai's mouth fell open but he didn't flash his teeth. His lips parted, but he didn't smile. His chest, which had gone from burning to dull, now deflated as he turned from Vivi to look out at the state of his waters. There were magical creatures in the Mediterranean. However, there were no such things as mermaids, half human, half fish. Most of the creatures living in the depths were gruesome-looking vertebrates with sharp teeth and tentacled monsters from the deep. He shuddered to think that Vivi had come in contact with those beasts. Then he looked back at her and realized, You swam all the way here from Britain? Most of the way, she nodded. I took a ley line. Ley lines were pockets of energy that witches and knights used to travel around the world. So she was a witch. A water witch? He'd never heard of such a thing. Well, said the water witch, it was a pleasure to meet you, god of the sea. She bowed her head in deference. She said the words matter-of-factly. Sai didn't believe they were truthful. But I must be off, she continued. I have a very important quest to complete. Vivi came to her knees. She gingerly put one foot under herself. It was as though she were new to walking, like a toddler who was still negotiating the mechanics of the task after months of crawling. 
Perhaps she was new to the skill if she'd spent most of her life in the waters. She made it to standing without any assistance and then began to teeter in her heels. It was slow going as she headed up the pier. Sai rose and came to her side in just a couple of strides. One of his steps easily ate up three of hers. Vivi gave him a sidelong glance. Sai got the feeling that his company was unwelcome. It was a new feeling for him, and it amused him. We're going the same way, he insisted earnestly. Because he was serious, he was not about to let this extraordinary creature go any time soon. You're going to the Nikatera store for the unveiling of this season's shoe collection? The name of the store sounded familiar, but Sai never paid much attention to shopping. He left that to his sister, Demeter, who treated spending money and acquiring goods like a contact sport. Sai had no clue where the store was, but that wasn't going to stop him from getting closer to Vivi. Of course, he said. I love shoes. Vivi's eyes lit up. Then her mouth opened, and she chatted on for a quarter hour about the history of Nikatera and his innovative designs and footwear. And that's how Lord Poseidon of Olympia, second son of Cronus, god of the sea, found himself having a conversation about... Chapter 3 I didn't care so much about shoes when I was younger, said Vivi. Medieval footwear for women wasn't so interesting because dresses covered the entire leg down to the foot. Vivi teetered over the wooden planks of the pier. She'd only practiced walking on smooth surfaces back in Camelot. Lady Gwyn and Dame Lauren had held her hands for a time as she'd taken her first few steps across the metallic drawbridge of Tintagel Castle. The god, Poseidon, Psy, strolled beside her. His casual steps swallowed up the wooden slats beneath them as though they were picks to clean his teeth. He didn't flash his teeth at her anymore, but he did stretch his lips wide as he looked down at her. He also continued to watch her with what looked like hunger in his eyes. Men's shoes were much more fascinating, Vivi continued. They had elongated toes like a needle-nosed garfish, raised heels and feathers, did you know that the laws once proclaimed the length of the toe of a man's shoe had to be proportionate to his income and social standing? Sounds like something an insecure man would do, he said. How do you mean? He flashed her with those teeth and Vivi tripped. Her left heel caught between two of the planks of the pier. Sai's hands reached out and grabbed her hands. Vivi gasped at the contact. His hands were much larger than Gwyn's or Lauren's. His palms swallowed her fingers up in their center as his long digits wrapped around her wrists. Vivi felt caught, trapped. And then she was airborne again. Sai lifted her up into the air, freeing her heel from the plank. He didn't put her down. He carried her off the pier and set her back down on solid ground. Vivi tilted her head up to look at the god before her. She had to look oh so far up since he towered over her. She felt like she would teeter backward instead of forward. She did stumble when he let her go. She felt entirely disoriented with his tenter hooks no longer pressing into her skin. Her hands floated limply to her sides. She watched him turn to the side and stick out his elbow. Vivi stared at his protracted arm, uncertain what to do with it. Was he offering her escort like the knights would offer the ladies of Camelot? He was the strangest predator she'd ever encountered. She took a deep breath. Then she lifted her hand and rested it in the crook of his elbow. The next few steps she took were effortless, with him as her anchor. In my experience, he said, most cultures cover the female foot differently than they do the man's foot. Too true, Vivi nodded with confidence now that they were back on her favorite subject. As ladies' gowns inched upwards, so too did the heels of their shoes. Beside her, she felt Sai's body rumble with... Was that laughter? The English heel was low and thick, 
much more suited to boots, she continued. The French heel was mid-height and curvaceous. Hmm, just like the French. The Italian heel, the stiletto, those were tall and spiky works of art. Hmm, just like the female form, said Sai. I see your point. The female foot has been revered as a powerful sexual stimulus throughout time. Sexual? Why? You can't put a foot anywhere inside the body. I know men like to put their appendages inside others' bodies. Sai stopped walking abruptly, causing Vivi to bump into him. He looked down at her with those wide eyes that were the crystal blue of the open seas. Then the rumbling went through him again. Because she was standing so near to him, she felt his laughter like the waves thrashing the side of a boat in a storm. Did I say something funny? She wondered what it might be. Humor was tricky with her, since fish and most other animals didn't have what humans called a funny bone. I find your candor wholly refreshing, Vivi of the Lake. Oh, he liked her openness. Well, it was no great secret about males trying to get inside women's bodies. They weren't the only creatures to exhibit such behaviors. I find the desire to enter another's cavity very strange, she continued. Except if it's sand inside of a clam, because then you get a pearl. Otherwise, it's entirely parasitic. Take the pearlfish, for example. They climb inside the anus of sea cucumbers and devour the animal's gonads within. Another rumbling of laughter erupted from Sai. He laughed so hard he doubled over. When he straightened, there were tears in his eyes. Oh no, I've made you cry. Is it because I spoke about anuses and gonads? I suppose that's not proper or ladylike talk. Vivi felt her face flushing. That reddening sign of embarrassment had been happening more regularly now that she was able to walk on land and speak with more humans. She was always saying the wrong things because she didn't have enough practice at being proper. Sai reached out and tilted her chin up. He rubbed his thumb over the warm spot on her cheek. His fingers were cold, the same temperature as she was but she still felt warmth fluttering inside of her. She'd seen men do this to the women they courted, hold their faces in their hand. Was she being courted by the god of the sea? No, that was ridiculous. He was likely checking the fat content of her body in case he changed his mind later and decided to eat her. He'd be disappointed, she was very lean due to her life submerged in waters and her diet of fish and sea vegetables. Vivi had never had a man touch her. She'd never even stood this close to a man before. Sai smelled of the sea, like home. He made her feel warm. He made her heart flutter. She was perspiring and her breath came quickly. Such a strange reaction. He may have been a wizard and casting a spell on her right now. Best to get away from him. Well, thank you for your assistance, my lord. She bowed her head, freeing his hand from her face. I've troubled you enough. Best to be on my way. I have to get to Nika Terra's before dawn. There's plenty of time before dawn, said Sai. I can drive you there in a few hours. I'll just need the street address. Street address? She didn't have that. She only knew where the store was located. It's here in Rome. Surely someone can direct us on the way to go. Rome? Italy? He cast her a sidelong glance. Vivi, darling, you're in Athens. Greece. Greece? Her large eyes went wide. Do you mean I came the wrong way? Chapter 4 all of this for a pair of shoes? Vivi looked up at Sai as he leaned back in his chair. He'd taken her from the streets of Athens and brought her into a high tower that he called his home. Out the window, she couldn't see the sea. It felt as though she was surrounded by salt water in his abode. The corner of Sai's mouth ticked up as he finished his comment, making her wonder if it was a legitimate question or a mocking statement. 
She'd always found humans so difficult to read. They could smile when they were being cruel. They could cry out of happiness. Fish had no facial expressions. They either ignored her and gave her their back fins, or they flashed their teeth and charged her. Shoes are transformative in fables and fairy tales, she said. Your whole life can change with the right pair of shoes. Sai leaned over and peered down at her legs, which were tucked under his dining table. Vivi had made sure to cross at her ankles the way she'd seen Lady Gwyn do when she'd come to sit on a rock at the river. Dame Lauren often sat with her legs splayed, but Lauren hadn't been raised a lady. She'd only come in to polite society when she'd become a knight. Those are nice shoes, said Sai. He leaned forward in his chair, placing his elbows on the table and resting his strong chin in the palm of his hand as he gazed at her. He didn't flash his teeth, but his gaze blazed into her, making her feel warm. It was a gentle yet insistent hum of energy. She looked down at the plate of food Sai had presented her. He'd served her a dish of raw fish wrapped in seaweed and rice. It was delectable, much nicer than food singed by fire. Sushi, he called it. Women's shoes have always seemed restrictive to me, Sai was saying. Vivi shook her head to deny it, and then realized that he had a point. The first time she'd put on her shoes, they had been tight, but it was the first time she'd actually felt her toes. She liked the pinched feeling. It reminded her that she had her freedom. When you put on shoes, you can go greater distances. She plopped the last roll into her mouth. Tuna, her favorite. Sai's gaze lingered on her mouth a moment before speaking. The farthest distance I've seen most women in fancy shoes go is up a social ladder. Take Cinderella, for instance. She swept floors and cleaned the fireplace. Suddenly she puts on a borrowed costume and pair of glass shoes, and the next thing you know she's bagged a prince. You make it sound as though she were dishonest in her quest, said Vivi. Her stepmother and sisters were evil inside, and they pulled on beautiful clothes to hide it. Cinderella's fairy godmother helped match her inner beauty with her outer beauty. In her rags and bare feet, Cinderella was already a princess at heart. All right, Sire leaned forward. Take Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. She stole shoes to gain power. No, said Vivi. Dorothy got magical shoes and did everything to get them off so that she could get back home. What about the red shoes? Vivi knew that story. It was about a young woman who becomes so vain about her shoes that the shoes take control of her. They force her to dance nonstop until finally she goes to the town executioner to have him chop her feet off. Before Vivi could formulate a response to the story, Sai continued. There are a number of stories where women move from wooden shoes or poverty to delicate glass shoes or royalty. I'm not interested in royalty, said Vivi. So you're Dorothy, not Cindy. I'm Vivi. I just want shoes. I want to stand on my own two feet. I don't want a fairy godmother. I've got two witch friends, though they're not my best friends. I do want a best friend of my own. But I don't want a prince. I'd like to keep my freedom, thank you very much. I just left the sea. I don't want to be kept in a gilded high tower. I would never cage you, Vivi. I like watching you walk. That's what I want, she said, to walk on land. I want to find my own place in the world. I want to wear pretty clothes and high heels. I want to have friends who want my company, for me, and not just to use my powers to get from place to place. I want to find a place where I belong as Vivi. She stopped her tirade and looked at him. He was doing it again. He was looking at her like she was a meal he wanted to devour. He hadn't touched any of the sushi himself. Perhaps he was fattening her up for a late night snack after all. I think you're beautiful, he said. I know I'm not. I'm pale. 
My hair is the color of the moon, not the sun. My breasts stopped growing back in the 16th century. I know men liked them big along with big derrieres as well. I think you're perfect. He leaned across the table. He was so near that she felt his warm breath on her cheek, and then she realized he wasn't trying to eat her at all. Are you going to kiss me? Vivi asked. Sai's grin spread, flashing sharp white teeth. That's disgusting! She jerked back, the legs of her chair scraped across the floor. Sai's brows rose as his top lip lowered over his incisors. I've never understood the practice, she shuddered. Why would you want to stick a random piece of your body in my mouth? And the tongue at that. Why not put my toes in your mouth? Vivi watched Sai's throat work as he struggled to swallow. The movement was surprisingly hypnotic, like the dance of a tropical fish undulating in the water. Vivi loved the taste of tropical fish even more than she did tuna. She had the strangest urge to reach out her own tongue and nibble the column of his neck. I just want to taste you. Sai's gaze dipped down to her feet. I promise I won't bite. Then what's the point of tasting if you don't? She didn't get the chance to finish her sentence. Sai's large body leaned across the table and took her mouth. Vivi tensed under the gentle onslaught of Sai's warm lips. Her upper lip was caught between both of his. She was falling, hook, line, and sinker. He released her lip, only for a second, but in that second, it was as though he reeled her in. She followed his lips, covering the vast inch worth of distance he'd placed between them until she was caught once more in his net. Sai's lips sealed over hers, capturing both her top and bottom lips this time. She felt engulfed by him, like she was drowning. Fear coursed through her at the weightlessness of it all. It felt like being untethered, without an anchor. The firmer he pressed his lips against hers, the further she sank into the bottomless depths of his desire. Vivi reached out, seeking some kind of support, any type of mooring or ballast. And there he was. He surrounded not just her mouth, he surrounded all of her. Like earlier this evening when he'd brought her out of the waters, she was flying. Vivi was terrified of flying, of being cast off. But not with this man. Sai brought her into his body. He wrapped his strong arms around her and cradled her in his embrace as he parted and probed her mouth. She let him in, let him surround her. He held her tightly, perhaps a little too tightly. But Vivi didn't mind. Sai's embrace felt like the first time she'd put on shoes. Perhaps that's why she didn't notice when her slippers fell from her feet. Welcome back. Hey, thank you so much. Um, so I was about to say that's the end, but that's not. You can join us back here on <laughs> Thursday for the second installment of Two with by C by Annis Johnson. So I think that's it, and we'll just see you then. <laughs> All right, tell them what to do. Fuck your day up. Make sure your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance.